everybody. And, and if we wanted a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. So if you, if you don't want to be seen on the recording, um, yeah, turn your, turn your video off. Uh, hello, June, by the way. Nice to see you as well. Or, or not see you, but you know what I mean. So uh, um, just, a, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, the, as I say, the meeting is being recorded. And, and also um, that you will receive a, a survey tomorrow um, about this evening's meeting. So we really appreciate um, any, any feedback that you give. And, um, uh, and I know Chris has, has, has already asked um, for feedback, so uh, we'll pass, pass comments on to Chris. And uh, without, without further ado, really, it, it, you know, I'd like to thank Chris um, uh, for, for uh, supporting us with this presentation tonight. Um, Chris, Chris Steele has been a, um, a specialist um, inspector for noise and vibration with the HSE since 2015. Uh, and prior to that, he was the senior research fellow and senior acoustic consultant, 13 years with Edinburgh Napier University. So I'm, I'm really thankful for, for Chris for, for uh, as I say, supporting us with his presentation. And uh, yeah, without, without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to you, Chris. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'll just put the slides up for you and uh, I'll start the tag. Right, so um, hopefully you can see that. I'll just put that at the bottom. So yeah, my name's Chris Steele and I'm a noise and vibration inspector with the Health and Safety Executive. So uh, talk today is gonna to be about hand arm vibration. And when I asked the, the committee members what they wanted me to talk about, they, they mentioned three things. They said they wanted me to go through common failings, so the sorts of things that we as HSE inspectors see that commonly come up. They also wanted to have a look at what changes can be made, so what kind of control measures can be put in place. And then the last thing was case studies, that they were keen to see some case studies. Uh, and I thought it would also be useful if, when I talk about the case studies, to talk about the things that, that we see that go wrong uh, or where people miss case studies. So start off with the common failings. Uh, and I was thinking about, well, how do I kind of show you that? Uh, and I thought this was quite a useful graph. So back in 2016-17, we did an assessment of all the enforcement that we took against hand arm vibration. And we found that about 50% of it was for health surveillance and the other 50% was roughly for control. Uh, now, a small portion of it was for a uh, risk assessment. And that doesn't mean to say that we think that the risk assessments are great. A lot of it just seems to be that we get what we want by asking for control. Um, so if we say you, know, you need to put in controls, that tends to mean that the, 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 the duty holder has to figure out what their you know, exposure levels are. And so by default, they do a risk assessment. So let's look at each one of these two things in, in, in detail, the health surveillance and the control aspects and start off with the health surveillance. So what's the number one issue that we have when we go on site and we're looking at health surveillance? Well, the number one issue with health surveillance is that people don't have health surveillance. That We checked in 2012 and we found that around about 75% of the companies who should have health surveillance for HAVs didn't have it. And we still think it's probably quite a significant portion of the companies who should have it who don't have it. And what we tend to find is that, uh, we, how we come across these companies is that an employee, their health gets so bad that they go to their own GP, their own GP effectively sends them off for diagnosis. They go back to their company, tell them about it. That company reports it under RIDOR, and then we start to uncover, in some cases, 40, 50, 60 other cases of halves across you know, larger organizations. So not having health surveillance is one of the biggest issues that we come across. Well, when should you have health surveillance? Well, you should have it when you're above the action value. Um, that's roughly the expectation. If you get above typically 2.5 metres a second exposure on a typical average day, that person should be getting health surveillance. So the obvious question that comes out of that is, well, how do we know when they're above 2.5 metres a second? And this here, this little rule of thumb, is the kind of thing that our inspectors hold in their head or they have it in the with their notebook written down and essentially if you're spending about an hour using a rotating tool so strimmers and uh, saws and, and grinders 
you're probably at the action value. You should have some sort of risk assessment. And if it turns out that you are at the action, the action value, you have the health surveillance. For impact tools, so hammer drills and breakers, slot shorter, 15 minutes of that tool use, and that gets you up to the exposure action value. So number two issue with health surveillance. So the first issue is people don't have it. Number two, the second issue we have is the reporting of the videos. So I mentioned there about people who don't report and then we come across them, we get 50, 60 because they didn't realize they were to do it. But one of the other issues with reporting on health surveillance is a lack of understanding of the information that's coming back from the health surveillance provider and the company not knowing that when they get the diagnosis, they're supposed to tell us. Now, to be fair to the companies, a lot of the times that is because it's not clear in the information that's been provided by their health surveillance provider. So, you know, does your health surveillance provider make it clear when you have to read or report? Because that's really important. That's something you should be checking for and something you should be asking them to show you when they come and provide you with services. And that tends to stem from the other issue that comes out of this, which is the service level agreement. Do you have a service level agreement with your health surveillance provider? So that's going to cover things like being specific as to what the, you expect from them, making sure that when they provide you with fit slips, that has the information on it, that lets you know what to do next. But it also covers things like, you know, maybe you want to change them, get another company in, and they disappear off with all your data. And then we've come across companies who have to consistently pay money to their old health surveillance providers to get access to data that they've paid for. So the service level agreement is really useful. And, and it shows you who's responsible for what, and it helps you understand where your, where your controls are. The third issue with health surveillance that we come across, well, the third issue is the exposure assessment and the fact that a lot of companies assume that they send their employee off to the doctor for a diagnosis, and they let the employee tell the doctor how much vibration they're exposed to. So you may have done your risk assessment, figured out that the person's only exposed to about, you know, 104 points over a typical working day because they're using tools for 25 minutes and 15 minutes. But when the, do when the employee speaks to the doctor, they will say, do you use power tools? And the employee says, yes, I use, I use a grinder all day long. And the doctor will take that at face value or may take it at face value and assume that this person's exposed to extremely high levels of vibration. The way that they diagnose halves is an exclusionary diagnosis. So they'll look for the symptoms and they'll exclude other issues like primary renals or carpal tunnel syndrome. And then when they're left with, yes, this looks like the symptoms for, for hand down vibration exposure, they'll also look for the, tool, the power tool usage. So when you send an employee for, for a diagnosis, you tell the doctor what their exposures are. You send the risk assessment with them. You send the exposure assessment with them so that they know this is what they're exposed to. Right, so that's the issues with health surveillance. What are the issues that we come across with control? So when we start going through this, we're gonna start talking about common failings, but also what changes can be made. So these two will kind of come into one another. And also there might be a little bit of case study stuff as well as I go through. Number one, the big issue, the things that's a common failing is the tool maintenance. It's a really simple thing. It's a really obvious thing, but we tend to see issues with it. It tends not to be there. Now, remember I spoke to you about the action values. How do you know what the exposures are? Down at the bottom, it says there that these, these action values are on the basis that we're looking at brand new tools that are low vibration design and they're well maintained. So what happens when you don't maintain power tools? The vibration level goes up. Now, that can be something like the the things which are specifically designed to control the vibration, they break down. So this is a chainsaw, uh, and they've got similar, like this with a vibration mount that's snapped. You'll see these types of things on style saws as well. When they work, they're really efficient at reducing the vibration from this tool. When they break, they transmit a lot of vibration into where the person is holding the tool. So the maintenance of the vibration control equipment on standardized tools is really important. If you don't do it, Hopefully you can see that. I've not put myself in front of it. That works there. Sorry, uh, I can move this. Yeah. That can change that type of tool from being something that you can use for two hours to being something that you can only use for 40 minutes. So that's that vibration specific control. But general tool maintenance as well. Um, 
just you know spending fifty pounds on doing changing the oil, making sure all the components are working correctly, sharpening the, the chain on a chainsaw, that can can significantly increase the amount of time you can use the tool for before you get to the action value. So again, from about 40 minutes to about two hours. Another number two issue when it comes to control is tool selection. That we want to see, we want to see, and our inspectors expect to see people picking the lower vibration power tools up. And the, te the term we tend to use is vibration efficient. So the thing that can do the job in the most effective way for the lowest level of vibration exposure. So take, for instance, stuff that's, that's going to be going up on our website. And this is brand new. We've done some assessments on the difference between battery powered tools and uh, petrol powered tools. And we found that generally the battery powered tools have got lower levels of vibration. So if you're looking at something like a chainsaw, can you use a battery powered chainsaw, which has got lower vibration exposure in comparison to a petrol powered one? Uh, the most obvious one in this assessment was pole saws. But we found that the battery powered pole saws were significantly lower in terms of vibration. That's partly because of the, the, the type of um, machinery that's in the battery powered one, but also because once you get a battery powered pole saw, the engine goes up at the top of the pole rather than at the bottom of the pole where the hand is. So trying to find the lowest power tool, that's what we expect to see. And if you're not doing that, you're running the risk of getting enforcement taken against you. So to say we're looking for something that does the job as well, if not better, with a lower level of vibration. That's the type of thing that we're looking for. Moving on from just that straight substitute, the tool selection as well. We're also looking for things where you've got tool adaptations or engineering controls. So this here, the, the taking bolts off of uh, machinery, using an impact wrench to do that, uh, that can be up to 10 meters a second, which means that after 16 minutes, you'd be at the action value. Whereas if you use a thing called a torque multiplier, and that's what these photographs are, uh, which is basically, it looks like an impact wrench, but it's got a reaction bar on it. So essentially it's levering off the bolt. Uh, they have got really low levels of vibration and they tend to be quieter as well. So you're getting a double kind of benefit from them. That instead of being 10 meters a second you're exposed to, it's 1.5. So the amount of time you can use that tool for, the amount of bolts you can remove goes up significantly. Number three, when it comes to control, is a thing I call missed opportunities. Chances where they could have done something to control vibration, but they missed the opportunity to do it. So that probably needs a bit of explanation. So the uh, thing that I like to say is, have you ever described a workplace health issue as a near miss? Have you ever seen something and thought, we were just about to expose somebody to a lot of vibration and we've figured out that's a problem and we should do something about it. So I'll give you a, a genuine example. So this is an actual concern that was raised by an employee. So somebody phoned us up and said, like, I'm really worried about this because I'm about to start a job. What do you think I should say? This is what the fella said. He says, I'm working uh, on a project where I have to fix brackets to a floor slab. So he's fixed them into the underside of the slab to suspend the ceiling and there's thousands of holes that have got to be drilled. He's done his own calculations. It's 468 holes. It's going to take him 39 minutes to do that. And he reckons that'll put him an exposure value of 390 points. So he's basically at the limit value. And that's on the assumption that he's using a tool that's well-maintained. If, if he ends up using one that isn't well-maintained, he could be well above the limit value. So how are we going to deal with that? And what's the missed opportunity for the control? Well, option number one is, well, let's stop working at 39 minutes. That's probably not going to cut it on a construction site. You know, they'll probably want to keep working. But that certainly is an option. Option number two is we looked for those missed opportunities. So let's go to a hierarchy of control. We've already looked at that administrative control, the job rotation and the time limiting. We're probably not going to be very effective. And the other thing about job rotation is that, yes, we reduce somebody's exposure but we're also, we're also spreading the exposure around more people rather than just one person. So are we, are we increasing the risk? So let's start off with the very basic stuff. We're gonna drill a hole using a drill bit. Well, are you using a sharp drill bit? Because that will make a difference. So really basic stuff. Then move up and think, well, could I use a diamond tipped drill bit? Because they tend to actually you produce lower levels of vibration if you're using that type of thing. And if you can use a diamond tipped one, and depending on how big the hole needs to be, could use a small diameter diamond drill core cutter and you can get very small ones now that can be used for putting in fixings. Once you move on to this type of tool then that means that you can use the power tool in a different way. If you're using this type of drill bit then you can switch off the hammer action 
uh, function on the on the, the drill, and that will further reduce the vibration. And then we then get into things. Well, can you not mount the drill on a rig? Uh, because once you put it in a rig, you there's less handling. You're further away from the tool, and you reduce the vibration further. Now that may not be a suitable thing for drilling that many holes, but there's certainly loads of opportunities to use uh, drill rigs and stuff when we're looking at vibration exposure. So that kind of gets us up to the top end of engineering controls, and we're starting to think, well, what about substitution? Is a safer way of doing this? Well, sometimes using a tool with a higher vibration magnitude can be suitable if the duration is significantly shorter. So what's the option there? Well, yeah, we're drilling holes, but the reason why we're drilling holes is because we want to fix a ceiling in. So essentially we're putting a hole so we can put a, a, a fixing into it. Can't we just put the fixing in straight away? And so these kind of short fire tools, they may be typically around sort of 22 meters a second, but it takes a fraction of a second to fire one of the bolts into it. Whereas the drill bit, which is 17 and a half meters a second, may take a number of a number of seconds, 30 seconds to drill a hole. So, you know, you get you get a, a lower level of exposure because it only takes 10 minutes to do the same number of holes. And that's really, um, you know, enticing to a construction company because it gives them an indication that we can get this work done and it's done in one task. So instead of drilling a hole and then putting a fixing in, we're going to just put the fixing in. So we're going to do this whole process a lot quicker and the way we're going to do it is going to be quicker. Right, so that then gets us, are we now at the top of what we can do? Have we, have we sort of uh, exhausted all the missed opportunities that we could look at? Well, I would say no, because there are other ways to suspend metal frames from the underside of concrete slabs. And that very much depends on how that's been detailed and specified. So in the bottom left-hand corner there, you've got a thing called a, um, a concrete slab that sits on a permanent shuttering. And sometimes that permanent shuttering can have grooves in it that allow you to put fixings in. So you can really reduce the number of drilling of holes that you can do. You can use block and beam systems where you can suspend the frame from the beam. So this starts to move into this whole idea of design. And I don't, for anybody who's involved in construction type stuff, this is a particular issue that if you go to a construction site and people are using power tools, then you've probably missed most of the opportunities to eliminate the risk. And the way that you eliminate risk, particularly in construction, is through the design. So in this instance, I would personally be going back to the designer and saying, this is a design issue. Why wasn't it raised with the designer? Why aren't they aware that the, that the materials and the way the things that they've specified are increasing the risk to people on site. Tend to find the designers are pretty good at understanding the ongoing risks of a building once it's in place, but they're not so great on understanding the risks that are created during the construction process. Right, so we're now moving into the sort of case study aspect of it. Uh, and I thought I would show you some case studies and try and mix it in with issues that we have with case studies and things that we'd like to see more of. So the basic stuff, you know, we talk about consumables. And again, if our inspectors go to site, they will always ask if they see people using grinders, could you be using a flapper disc? Because they've got lower vibration. So you'll get quite a lot of pushback on that from companies because they'll say they might, not, they might not get the level of uh, finish that they're looking for. But there's a lot of debate about whether that is true or not, and it very much depends on what they're trying to do. But we definitely ask for this sort of thing. It's the sort of thing that we would ask duty orders to, to look at. In terms of a, a, a case study, this one here, this is a company that was, uh, what they were doing was drilling into the side of an embankment to stabilize it. And it was my colleague in the Cardiff office who saw this. They were working from, um, from ropes and they were using this drill that you can see on the left-hand side in a horizontal way, so they're drilling horizontally into this embankment to stabilize it. And they were being exposed to a lot of dust, a lot of hand arm vibration, a lot of noise. And they also had working at height issues and rope access issues. And so we said to them, is there any way that you could do it differently? And there was a discussion and said, yeah, well, there's a machine that you can buy that will do it. This is a relatively small one. You can get ones which are much larger. And the cost of the machine was 180,000 pounds. So quite a sizable uh, cost, but actually they recovered the cost of that machine on the first job that they did. So, you know, they've substituted it for another process. They've eliminated a lot of risks just by doing that. And those are the kind of things that HSE really want companies to focus on, things that will make a significant difference to the productivity 
and the safety and health of an overall task. So a similar one, so this was, this was actually last week, um, there's a site I went to two years ago, they were using handheld grinders to do a lot of linishing and deburring work on uh, metal components. And I said to them, have you ever thought about buying a machine for that? Uh, and I said, well, look, I'm not going to force you to do it, you know, but I certainly think it's something you should look at. I returned to them uh, two weeks ago for another visit and they went out and bought this machine, it cost them £100,000, so it's a sizable investment for them, but it recovered its cost in six months. But in addition to that, it's significantly quieter, so they've eliminated the noise risk. And not only have they kind of almost eradicated the grinding from that task that they were doing, but they've reduced their vibration exposure across the entire work site by 60% because they're using this machine for a lot of, lot of other things. So the productivity they're getting out of it is significantly enhanced. So again, that idea of, you know, look for ways to reduce vibration, but also focus on the ones where you're going to get an improved, you know, process and improved production system. Right, so let's kind of come back to the case studies. What are the things that I come across that I think are an issue when I go to site and I see what people are doing and take, take them to task on, you know, their control measures? Well, the number one issue is that if it's HSE guidance suggests something uh, as a control measure, it's something that our inspectors expect to be done. So if you go into the L140 document, the HSE's guidance document for HAVs, table number three that's in there talks about a list of different things that people can do. So it's split by industry, it outlines some of the problems, and then it gives you some of the solutions. And these are things that our inspectors are trained to look for and asked and told to ask for when they go to site. So if you're doing amenity horticulture, we absolutely expect to have a conversation about, can you use vehicle mounted flails and mowers? Are you looking at low, slow growth um, planting? Could you look at natural meadows, that type of stuff? And yes, some companies you know, can't do that, but we expect them to have a good reason for why they're not using these types of control measures. So this is the first place, the first protocol, that if you're dealing with a company, if you are the duty holder or you're giving advice to the duty holder, you know, you, see, you go out to see a company that does amenity horticulture, we absolutely expect those things to be in there for them to have thought about. The next step down from that, in terms of what HSE says, is in the HSE's vibration topic pack. This is the document that, go, that our inspectors use as their enforcement guide for vibration. Now it's on the website, I've got links to it in the end of the talk, um, but essentially it's, it's very similar to what's in the guidance document, it just goes into a bit more detail. So if an inspector is going out to look at drilling masonry, they will they will give them some information on, on the expected exposures and it tells them what to look for. And so they will ask questions about these things and if they don't get the answers that they're looking for, then you're running the risk of enforcement being taken against you. And I think if you're if you're doing consultancy work, or if you are the health and safety advisor for your company, it's worth having a look at it and saying, look, this is what the HS would, HSE would ask if they turned up tomorrow on a vibration inspection visit. And, you know, if we are not doing these things and they think we could, if they've seen somebody else doing it, if they've seen one of our competitors doing it, we could be running the risk of a, a note letter, a notice of contravention letter, or an improvement notice. Coming down from that again, there are still a lot of guidance documents on our website. This one here, Vibration Solutions, it's quite an old one, 1997, but it's still got a lot of really good stuff in it. You've actually seen some of the good stuff that's in it already, because some of the things that you've seen uh, with the tool maintenance, that's, that's in there, and there's other um, control measures in there as well. So it's certainly worth looking at, and it's the sort of thing that, that we say, well, look, you know, have a look at these documents and, and you know, have an understanding that these are the things that we, we look for. The number two issue that we get with case studies is that people tend not to check what's on our website. And for me, this is a relatively simple process. You know, so I was trying to think about, well, how, how, do you do, how can I explain this to you? Uh, and I thought about the, the Barbican in London. And you're probably wondering, why am I talking about this? Well, you know, it's got all that kind of, if you've seen it, it's got all this kind of knobbly concrete on the outside of it. And it turned 50 a few years ago. And uh, in an article I read that said that, you know, they were extolling the virtues of the, the fact that this wonderful architectural finish had been done 
entirely by hand with somebody using a handheld handheld breakers and this did a wee quick calculation and I worked out that it was something like 200,000 square meters of power tool use just on the residential blocks. Now, architectural scabbling, if you see someone doing that, that is a prohibition notice. We will absolutely stop you from doing that if we see it on site. Uh, this is now the point we say, well, this is 1979, this happened to Chris, surely no one's still doing that. I can assure you there are still companies who want to do architectural or decorative scabbling. So, my point with number two is check and see what the HSC says about it. So if you Google HSE scabbling vibration, what will come up are our case studies. They're on the website. You're usually your best to look through Google, Google rather than through the HSE website because Google tends to find these things a lot better. But it's got options for it. Number one is grip blasting instead of scabbling. Yeah, there's a noise issue where, with that. There's a dust issue with that. So it may not be the best option but it is a good way of reducing vibration exposure. Another way of doing it is specialized form work. So you have something that you pour the concrete into and it creates that look that you're wanting. That's in the case studies as well. That comes up as one of the things that we look for. And then if you're not doing that kind of decorative scabbling, but you're doing scabbling in general. So one of the things that they scabble is so that you can pour again the next day. Then we've got these, this suggestion that you could use paint on materials which slow down the cure of the concrete so the next day you get the reduced, um, you can scabble, you don't have to scabble. Number three, uh, when we talk about the case studies is people not checking what your industry uh, says and to see if it can be done differently. So there are guidance documents held by industry associations. The obvious one that springs to mind for me is the Drilling and Sawing Association. They're involved in concrete demolition um, and so what they've got is a, a document that says, here's a range of things that, that you can do using low vibration, lower, lower dust, lower noise methods. So you want to remove a slab or reduce the depth of a slab. The old fashioned method or the typical method is, let's go and get ourselves a handheld breaker, let's smash it up with that, and then we'll shovel it out. Well, the controlled method is you get yourself a low vibration still saw, the one with the lowest vibration that, or cut off saw rather, that you can find you shove it in one of these trolleys because that will reduce the vibration further. And oh look, it comes with a um, water suppression system so you don't have to worry about dust. And then what you do is you score the slab with the cut off saw. So you make this kind of pattern that leaves these little strips and then you break the strips off with a crowbar. And that is a way of significantly reducing the vibration exposure and the dust and the noise. So, that's me kind of getting to the end of the talk. I know it's probably not as, as long as you thought, but I'm guessing given that it's sort of six o'clock, you probably want me to shut up as soon as possible. But uh, yeah, there's common failings. Those common failings that we have are associated primarily with health surveillance and control. For the health surveillance, it's very much about, you know, having the health surveillance and knowing when to report to us and making sure that your health surveillance provider is giving you good information. For the control failings, as we start moving into what changes that can be made, the tool maintenance, the tool selection, and looking for those missed opportunities is what we're looking at. And when it comes to the case studies, it's look, be aware that there are certain things that HSE absolutely expects, and that's in our guidance documents. And then there's general case studies, which are freely available on our website. And you'd be surprised at how much is up there if you, you come across a problem and have a Google for it and see if it's there. So I'm gonna finish at this point because I've probably gone on far too long now. Those are the links. I'll send a copy of these slides through to you so you can get a hold of them. Um, and given that it is now out with normal working hours, uh, I'll be taking off my HSE inspector's hat. So if anybody wants to ask me questions which are specific to jobs that you've got, as long as you don't uh, tell me the name of where you are, I can give you some advice, hopefully. Uh, so that's the end of the talk. That was brilliant, Chris. Thank you so much. We've um, you, lots and lots of content there and some really helpful pointers. I think that we can all really valuable pointers. Um, we've had uh, one question come in so far. I'm sure now the floor is open for questions. There'll be more. Um, it came quite early in when you were talking about um, the companies that were missing health surveillance. Um, Mark Startin was asking, did those people have um, health and safety managers or offices? Officers? Was it was it that role that was missing it, or would, was it 
the role didn't exist and that's how it typically got missed. Um, I, I think there's a lot of companies that don't realise they're exposing people to vibration so they don't think that they need it. The other issue that we find with health surveillance is because there's this sort of medicalised function with it, there's a question as to whether it should be the health and safety manager who deals with it or the human resource manager who deals with it. Now, my, my experience is that I, I'm not really too bothered who it is, but there needs to be working between the, the, um, the HR manager and the health and safety manager, because if they're not talking, uh, a lot of the times what happens is that the, the ill health information gets sent to the HR manager and they don't realise that it's that they need to tell the health and safety manager this is an issue because they are the person that's re- that tends to be responsible for reporting under rid of. Yeah, I don't know if that's answered the question or not, but yeah, um, the companies tended to have somebody who was health and safety manager of some description, and it was getting missed because of the management of it. That's great. And is that, um, sorry, going off a slight tangent, is that the kind of thing where you would hope that if people have got the ISO standards, that's the kind of way that those management gaps get picked up because they're, they're looking for that kind of movement of information fluidly through an organisation? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm guessing you mean the ISO sort of management standards. Is that the sort of thing that you mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. HSE seems that we there are some ISO standards that we absolutely ask for and other ones that, that we don't and we're always kind of keen that we don't overburden people with, with things but certainly yeah people that are using the management systems uh, tend not to miss these things uh, more so than people who aren't using management systems. That's great thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Mariah Hocking. Has any research been done into the amount of wear on tools versus the increase in vibration? Basically how much how worn is too worn? Um, no I don't think so. We, we've, we've got if you have a look at our um, uh, in the guidance document there's appendix three and also if you have a look uh, if you have a look in that you'll see that we give a range and we've split it into percentiles. So we've got a lower percentile at 10 percentiles and 90. And so there's the low end and the high end and then the middle range expected expectation. That's based on years of tool measurements that we've done. And we think that most tools are roughly in. So if you look at something like a, you know, an impact drill, you reckon most of them are within that range and there might be the odd outlier. But no, there hasn't been any that I know of. I don't think there's any uh, research that's been done on on how long it takes to go to a kilter. Something that people ask about the maintenance is, well, well, what is correct maintenance? And and all we would be looking for at HSE is, well, look, you've got a manual for the tool. If it says that you change the bushes every three years, then that's good enough for us. Yeah. So is um, one of the things that I've come across is, is that, that you ask about the manual, they ask about the maintenance, you ask about what does it say in the manual, and they're like, manual? What what manual? Yeah. Um, is that something you encounter? Yeah, yeah. The 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 kind of a, a kind of lack of understanding that the manual has got some advice. Now, I mean, to be fair to the tool manufacturers, one of the things that you do notice, particularly for things like chainsaws and cut off saws, is that they actually have a matrix table somewhere in the document, which is really simple to follow, and it will say things like you know, like six months oil, nine months change the bush. Um, 12 you know 24 months staying back for service so it's not difficult to find it in most for most tools uh, so there's a, another thing there is we are also aware that some tools are, are, are essentially a commodity item and uh, there's no point in maintaining it because you just buy a new one so like handheld grinders tend to fall into that category so you know we're not going to ask for maintenance on something that that's going to cost you twice as much to maintain it as it would to just replace it that's really helpful um but sorry bear with me a second i've just lost the next next question um grant skinner is asking how often should power tools i.e cordless drills and angle grinders be tested for vibration levels um <clears throat> so we don't we don't ask for tools to be tested you know on a periodic basis um I know that some companies do do that, partly to, and primarily to check to see if it is going out of condition. 
uh, and a condition test is, is something that some companies do. We don't have too much of an issue with that. What, what we tend to have an issue with is, and we see a lot of this offshore, uh, and it boggles my mind that they do it, is that they box up all the power tools into a crate container, send them back to the beach and get them all tested in a, in a, in a bench test and take that information as if it's what it would be like when it's been used on site. And so that isn't representative of the tool in use. So using that information as the tool in use isn't going to be helpful, but using it as a way to figure out has this tool got worse, that's, that's not a problem. But we don't, we don't set a frequency for it and we, we tend not to ask for vibration measurements. It's, um, I mean, the guidance, the, the regulations don't actually ask for vibration measurements to be done. It's not a, it's not a requirement of the regulations. Um, you know, that, that rough rule of thumb, I'll give you a quick example. See the rough rule of thumb that's there? Say I went into a small company that has fewer than five people, so they technically don't have to have a written risk assessment. So maybe a small workshop. If I walked in and the, fella, the, the person who was running it said, well, look, I saw your rule of thumb and I'm using a grinder for 30 minutes a day, uh, or sorry, for about an hour a day. So I think I'm above the action value. So I'm going to do tool maintenance. I'm going to do buy the lowest vibration tool I can get. I'm going to look for ways to substitute it. I've already got the health surveillance and I've done information instruction training to my staff. There isn't really any point in me saying, well, you don't actually know what your total exposure is because he's done everything that he would need to do to control. So we don't want people to be, you know, we certainly want people to know what they're likely to be exposed to. And it's, a, a, it's what we call a credible estimate of exposure is what we're looking for. And um, it's really important to, to know, do I need the health surveillance? Do I need to put controls in place? Do I need the information instruction and training? And not to get too caught up in understanding, you know, is it, is it you know, 2.56 or 2.57 meters a second that they're exposed to over a day. Um, the thing, if you look at our calculator, so I was going to say, if you look at our calculator that's online, if you put in some numbers that gets you to around about 60 points, you'll see that it starts flashing up red and suggests to you that you might be above the action value. That's because there's quite a lot of variability in the measurement. There's variability in the person using the tool and there's variability in the tools themselves. So you can never be totally sure what someone's been exposed to, to a greater or lesser extent. So you want a good credible estimate and then do something about reducing the exposure. That's brilliant. Really comprehensive answer. Thank you, Chris. Um, James Shepherd's asked, what are your opinions on the use of have monitors such as Re ReactDeck? So, um, Again, we don't ask for ongoing monitoring or measurement. That's something that we that we don't ask for at HSE, um, and for those reasons that I explained about, you know, this idea of, of reasonable reasonable estimations of exposure. We know a lot of people like using them, and the things that that we like about them are the management aspect of it that you can use it to highlight somebody who you think they went over, you know, the limit, or using them to figure out oh. The people who do this type of job are really exposed. So, I, I, like I did a, a, a visit to a local authority who were using these types of devices, and they quickly found that, you know, all the all the horticultural people that did the parks and the greens and all that were okay. It was the people that were doing the the grass cutting for the old age pensioners that the ones were the ones who were really exposed to high levels of vibration because they found that from the, the systems. But we don't ask for those types of things, and. Um, uh, the other thing about it is, is that it's collecting data on your people that work for you. And, you know, I, I, that's, that can be useful for me if I'm trying to take you to task because I can then demonstrate that you've got loads and loads of people that have been exposed above the upper action value. I believe that the um, insurance companies are quite keen on them uh, because it shows what you've been doing before and after. But it's not something we ask for. And that other thing... Like an analogy I like to use, and it goes for monitoring, whether it's for noise or for vibration, you know, you need to know that what you're getting from it is going to be beneficial for you in terms of management. But I, I kind of analogy I look at, if I said I was going to lock you in a room that was too hot, and I, I told you you could only take one or two things in with you, one of them's a thermometer and the other one's a fan, which one would you want to take in? <laughs> you know, so. I love that. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, 
Alan Plom has asked um, or an observation and a question. Uh, the grounds maintenance sector um, and local authority in local authorities have a poor record in terms of exposures and house cases and consequently HSE enforcement. The HSE guidance for the amenity horticulture is very helpful, but needs to be more widely publicised. But how? Uh, <laughs> well, you're asking the wrong person because uh, I have. Uh, I hope you're not recording this, but <laughs> I have conversations <laughs> with the people that I work with and say, "Look, you know, can we?" I'm a bit fed up telling people to do dust monitoring. Can we maybe start doing stuff on noise? So yeah, it does need to be more widely uh, put out. I, I did. We did try, try speaking with uh, some of the horticultural associations and greenkeeper associations, and we have been round a few local authorities, helping their how, helping their local authority inspectors understand how to assess the risk for things like golf courses and that type of thing. But yeah, I totally agree. It definitely needs to be improved. How we do it, um, I need to get more support from HSE to do it. But uh, if anybody's involved in the horticultural stuff and they want more information, we can do that. So I I'll give you an example. We we went to for the Forestry Commission and we sort of looked at them and said, well, you're a, lead you're a leader in the forestry activity. So we'll do training. We did, we did some training days with them and they then went out into industry and passed that through. So I think if we could do something similar with horticulture, if we could find a, a major player in that field and use them as a key area to do training and then use their expertise to push it into the rest of the industry, that might work. Brilliant. Yeah. Hopefully there's someone in our audience who's who's pricked their ears up and can uh, get on the case with you. Um, another question that has come in, the use of battery powered handheld tools is increasing with longer battery life. Is the HSE noticing any impact in terms of reductions in have cases? Um, well, we're not, I wouldn't know if we're seeing reductions in have cases, but we, we definitely are seeing for some battery power tools lower vibration. I've showed a slide with some information on it. There's a big report about to be published probably within the next couple of weeks, actually. Which is an amazing thing for each of they've imagined to publish things because uh, we're not the fastest at it and it will give you a list of a load of power tools that are battery powered and petrol powered what the differences are for noise and for vibration and once that's out i think that'll be a really useful resource for people to check and see what the differences are and and we know i think i think it was cardiff or swansea council uh, they've switched over to battery power tools because well, they, they like the fact that it's lower vibration, so it's dealing with a halves issue. They also like the fact that it's battery powered, so they can say that they're doing stuff for the environment. And they like the fact that they don't have people driving around with, you know, tanks of petrol and cans of petrol sort of rolling around in the back of vans. Brilliant. That's, um, that's the end of the questions as I'm currently in the chat. Oh, no, there's one more just popped in. Bear with me. Um, we use hand digging tools. These do not come with a vibration value as they are not powered, but staff do occasionally report vibrations when digging. Is there any way for us to proactively determine whether this is a problem other than by using have monitors? We've not had any problems highlighted during our health surveillance. So with, so these are, yeah, like things that aren't power tools. So like, like for, a, for a hammer, for instance, um, the, the mechanics of how that works is very different to the type of vibration that someone's exposed to using a, a power tool. So we don't typically see hand arm vibration coming out from that. What we tend to find is that it's more musculoskeletal issues that, that people are having to deal with. Uh, I do know that you can get, um, like for, for instance, you get hammers that have got tuning forks in the bottom of them that reduce the, the vibration. But what we tend to find with people who use these who use hand tools is that they break their grip at the point where they're, they're doing the, the heaviest work so that they don't get that that transfer of of, of energy into their arms and um, but no they're not something that we see as a significant risk for hand arm vibration and it's probably more of an, an msd type issue brilliant thank you very much um roger that's everything we've uh, everything that's been posted in the chat so i'll hand back over to you Lovely, thanks, Alice. What a, what a great job as always on the on the QA, and uh, thanks, Chris, for uh, for answering all those questions. It was a, a sterling job and a, and a fantastic presentation. And uh, I think in in sort of midshire's uh, fashion, we we give a virtual round of applause, please. Thank you.
Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for uh, for, for giving the presentation tonight. Uh, really, really do appreciate it. Um, uh, one thing, one thing I'll say just before I go. Look, um, I will send the slides, but if you if you need to get in touch with me, um, I'm I've, I'm on LinkedIn. If you look me up, I'm on there, and I'm quite happy. To, if people send me questions that way, I'm quite happy to answer questions here as long as it's not you know. You know, can you tell me how to do some consultancy work or something like that? But yeah, feel free to find me on LinkedIn. There's a few faces I recognise from LinkedIn here, so that's it's nice to see them. Yeah, Brilliant. Oh, lovely, lovely. Thank, thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a brilliant offer. Thank you. And uh, oh, welcome, Alan. How was the bowls? Yeah, we, it was a close match, twenty-one twenty. We won. That was all right. That's the main thing. <laughs> No, yeah, I, sorry, 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 I was late. Sorry, Roger. Um, no, Chris, yeah, sorry, I was late. I, I, I did put something right at the end there in the chat. Uh, obviously, I, I follow you on LinkedIn and so on, and um, I find it really helpful, the stuff that you flag up, actually, and that I share with my sort of ground care chums and local authorities. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend anybody follow Chris because uh, he gives us a good head up on, on uh, all sorts of things to do with noise and vibration. So, well done. Thank you. Thanks. Lovely. Thanks, Thanks, Alan. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, well, at least without further ado, really, it's um, yeah, it's that time just to say thank you very much. It's it's lovely to to see so many of you this evening, and um, I wish you all the all the best. Stay safe. Uh, we don't have a meeting in August. We have our summer break. We're all on we're all on holiday in this country, of course. So. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. What I would say for, for any mid shards members that are amongst you, um, we will be sort of hanging on for 10 or 15 minutes. So if you want any networking or um, have a chat or any update, uh, please, please feel free to stay on the call. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all. So anyway, but thanks very much and uh, see you all soon. Cheers.